Good morning, Jacksonville. I'm Violet. And I'm Duncan, and you're watching JNLC News. News. Your top Jacksonville and national and international news. On headlines today, the U.S. Supreme Court is now dealing with the homicide of a 17-year-old in Orlando, Florida. Yes, Violet. 17-year-old Trayvon Martin was murdered on his way home from a convenience store. Zimmerman, 28 years old, claims Martin attacked him and he shot in defense, according to the police. Martin's family supporters say the unarmed 17-year-old was no more threatening than a bag of Skittles candy and the iced tea he was carrying. The shooting has grabbed national headlines and he has renewed the national conversation about race or relations, gun laws, and even how young men dress. It sparked a national furor that reached all the way to the White House, prompting President Barack Obama last week to call for a national search to discover how something so tragic could happen. Protests continue Monday with rallies planned for major cities across the country. Zimmerman, a white Hispanic and family and supporters of Martin uh, believe race was an issue in the shooting. Zimmerman's family says he has been mistakenly portrayed as racist. A uh, special uh, prosecutor is investigating the case with a grand jury scheduled to begin deliberations on April 10th. The prosecutor, Angela Corey, said last week that she does not know if a grand jury will be necessary. Nearly two-thirds of whites and 86% of non-whites say Zimmerman should be arrested, says CNN uh, polling director Needing Holland, as well as majorities of Republicans and de Democrats. And independent voters, Sanford Authority, say they could not arrest Zimmerman under Florida law's stand your, gr stand your ground law which allows people to use deadly force to defend themselves anywhere they feel a reasonable fear of death or serious injury. The evidence police had at the time didn't allow for an arrest. Police have said Zimmerman attorneys said Sunday that after re reviewing Florida's stand your ground law, he believes it applies to the situation at his client and innocent. Zimmerman said he was driving in his gated community when he saw Martin walking and called 911 to report a suspicious person. He told the dispatcher he was following the teen, but the dispatcher told him that wasn't necessary. Moments later, several neighbors called 911 to report a commotion outside, and police, police arrived to find Martin dead of a gunshot wound. Wow, what a tragedy. It's interesting to see how politics and constitutional laws intertwine. Speaking of politics, let's take a look at our scandalous politicians today with Brandon. Thank you, Violet. And yes, scandalous indeed. Sexy Rexy is at it again, folks. The news continues to pour in about City Councilman Rex Robertson's most recent sex scandal. Of course, last week we first reported here at JNLC News that the councilman had been caught cheating on his wife for the third time in just 15 months. And now the identity of his latest fling has been revealed. And she is none other than the councilman's chief financial aide, Jan Eagleman, who also happens to be his wife's twin sister. The two were caught in the parking lot of local government hotspot, the Sizzler, when police responded to a report of strange noises coming from the councilman's car, a birthday gift from the wife. According to the restaurant's staff, it had been a wet lunch for the lovers, and after they were asked to leave the premises, things began to get hot and heavy in the parking lot. Robertson and his people have refused to comment onto, to our own Chet Walters on anything yet, but have released a statement claiming that he still will not be resigning. Back to you, Duncan. Well, that's one hell of a story on Sexy Rexy, but let's take a look at how Greece is holding up in their crisis. Violet, want to, take, uh, want to tell us about your hometown's tragedy? Well, Duncan, it's a very sad tragedy, but there is hope for a country that has faced m many moments of truth over the past few years. Greece is on the cusp of... <laughs> can we go back? Okay. Well, Duncan. Starting from Duncan or starting from Violet? Starting from Violet or starting from Violet? Starting from Violet. All right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, you can go. Well, that's one of hell of a story on Sexy Rexy, but let's take a look at how Greece is holding up in their crisis. Violet, want to tell us about your hometown's tragedy? 
Well, Duncan, it is a very sad tragedy, but there is hope. For a country that has faced many moments of truth over the past few years, Greece is on the cusp of what could be a real make or break moment. The nation's private sector creditors have until the end of the day Thursday to decide whether or not to accept a proposed re restructuring of Greek government bonds. But there were signs that a significant number of bondholders will volunteer for the debt swap, which Greece needs to avoid a default. I think people are feeling more confident than they will get the minimum required to make the deal go through, said Kathy Jones, a fixed income strategist at Charles Schwab. But we're still waiting to see how this plays out. The terms of restructuring are not attractive for the bondholders. They have been invited to voluntarily take part in a write down and debt swap that could result in losers of up to 75%. For Greece and the Eurozone, the stakes are potentially huge. The agreement on private sector involvement, as it is known, is the final hurdle Greece must clear to meet all the conditions of its second 130 billion euro bailout program from the European Union and International Monetary Fund. Assuming the PSI process goes smoothly, European Union fi finance ministers are expected to sign off on the final portion of the bailout after a conference call Friday. If all does not go according to plan, however, Greece's bailout could be in jeopardy and the nation would face the prospect of a messy default within weeks. Okay. The fallout from a disorderly Greek default would spread across the Eurozone and beyond with contingent liabilities in excess of 1 trillion euro according to recent internal estimates from the Institute of International Finance. The key to a successful outcome lies in participation rate, which measures how many bondholders agree to the PSI terms voluntarily. The IIF announced Wednesday that a group of more than three 30 institutions had agreed to participate in the restructuring. The banks, insurance companies, and other investors own an aggregate of 84 billion euros worth of Greek bonds, which amounts for, to 40.8 percent of the 206 billion euro that Greece owes for the private sector. The announcement marked an increase from the 12 members the IIF said had agreed to the deal earlier this week. Still, the group added in a statement that all eligible bondholders must make their own decisions on whether or not to participate in the debt exchange offers based on their own particular interests and on the advice and assistance of their own advisors. The IIF, a Washington DC based industry group, represented the private sector in the protracted negotiations over the terms of restructuring. It has more than 450 members in 70 countries. Separately, German insurance company in Munich, which were not among the IIF members, included in Wednesday's announcement, said it will restructure an estimated 1.6 billion euros worth of Greek government securities, according to a spokeswoman. Another potential participant is the Bank of Greece, which has reportedly agreed to swap bonds held by Greek government pension funds. While the list of volunteers has grown, most analysts expect the agreement will fall short of full participation. Ideally, Greece would need 90% of bondholders to the volunteer for the exchange to close its funding gap to ensure that the participation rate is high enough. The Greek government retroactively inserted collective action clauses in the contracts that govern its bonds issued under domestic law. The causes would give Greece the authority to force bondholders who do not volunteer to take part in the restructuring to abide by the terms anyway. However, Greece needs a sufficiently large number of investors to volunteer for the restructuring in order for it to be considered a collective action. On Tuesday, Greece's public debt management agency suggested that if the participation rate is too low, bondholders would be subject to restructuring under less favorable terms than the ones included in the PSI deal. The unofficial target for the participation rate is at least 66%. Anything below that threshold might not be considered voluntary, which would make it difficult to argue that the action was collective. 
On the other hand, if more than 66% of investors volunteer for the restructuring, Greece could use collective action clauses to make the terms binding for all bondholders. That could result in effective par participation rate of 100% of domestically issued Greek bonds and unlock the full amount of Greece's bailout. The agreement involves investors volunteering to write down 53.3% of the value of bonds and swap Greek debt securities with lower interest rates. It would eliminate 107 billion euros from Greece's debt load and save the nation another 150 billion euros in refinancing costs over the next few years, according to the IIF. Good to know there is hope out there for Greece and hopefully America's economy will boost as well. I don't know about you, Violet, but I'm sure as hell tired of paying three ninety for a ga uh, for a gallon of gas. Yeah, talk about four ten a gallon for diesel, pain in my ass. We now go live for our reporter in the field, Shet Walters, who is coming to us from a forest fire that just broke out near Davis Park. Shet. Uh, hello, thanks Violet and everyone. I'm Chet Walters and I'm reporting from a massive fire that just sprang up out of nothing here in the woods behind Davis Park near Smith and Elk. Firefighters and police show up very quickly and they're doing all they can to contain the flames. I'm also pleased to say that no one has been injured in the blaze. Have firefighters been able to tell what started the fire, Chet? No, they haven't been able to figure out how the blaze started. My guess is all the young kids running around here, horsing around. They run this wild in this neighborhood. Yes, that's not too far from your house, is it, Shet? And it is your day off, so how did you arrive on scene so quickly? Uh, actually, I just wa was on a walk, uh, saw some smoke, and before I knew it, cops and firemen were all over the place. I really don't know how it started. What it what is the question? <laughs> what is wrong, Chet? You seem nervous. <laughs> Please have evacuated the area, and once again, there are no leads in, on how the fire began. And this is Chet Walters, and goodbye. That was Chet Walters reporting live from a forest fire right by his house. That's like three in two years. <laughs> Well, enough with the tragedies. Let's take a look at our UNF football team with John. Thank you, Violet. In sports news, the boys of fall were back in in fine form in a historic game this past Monday night. The Jackson Jag Jacksonville Jaguars played, of all people, the UNF Ospreys NCAA Division I men's football team in its inaugural game kickoff was at 6 o'clock, and the sold-out crowd was the loudest that it's ever been at Everbank Field on this cool Monday night. The Ospreys chose to defer possession to the second half, but that didn't seem to matter as Jaguars' six-year running back Maurice Jones-Drew fumbled after a thunderous hit from junior linebacker J.A. Massey. The Ospreys swooped their way downfield and gained an early 7-0 lead on a heavenly touchdown pass to receiver Drew Bellamy, who is in his first season in the sport. The two teams stayed deadlocked through the rest of the first half until Jones-Drew broke free on a 36-yard touchdown run to tie the game seconds before halftime. When the Ospreys started their drive in the second half, they were muddled down at about the Jaguars' 40-yard line and had to settle for a field goal. The Jags then unleashed a fury of a drive that led to another Jones-Drew touchdown, this time leaping over the pile into the midst of a group of Ospreys. Jags leading 14-10, to 10, the next few drives were evenly matched until Jags QB Gabbert tossed a short shovel pass to Jones-Drew, who took a few steps and crumbled to the ground as his left knee buckled and he was carted off the field. It was later determined that he tore all three major ligaments in his knee and would be out indefinitely. This was the opening the Ospreys were looking for, and on their next play, their senior quarterback threw an incredible 86-yard pass that was hauled in to give them a 17-14 lead over the pros. With the fourth quarter starting, both teams seemed to show no quit. Jags' new owner, Shad Khan, even made his way down to the sideline to motivate his players. Jags received the ball and settled for a field goal to tie the game once more, then kill time off the clock with their next few drives. With less than one minute left in the game, the Jags try for an onside kick, but the Ospreys come up with the ball. A series of short passes to the sidelines allowed them to march down the field and use minimal clock time. With 15 seconds left in the clock of the clock running back, start over. Start right there with 15 seconds. With 15 seconds left on the clock, running back Clay Price hammers it five yards up the middle for the Ospreys' final score of the night. With a score 24-14, the Jags make one last attempt at glory, but the ball is intercepted 
as time runs out, leaving the Joes, upsetting the pros. Back to Duncan. Let's now take a look at the daily. Man on the street with Bree and Carrie. Well, good to take a look at some of our Republican views. John, would, be, would you be kind enough to inform us on the weather forecast for the week? Why, yes, Violet. Today's weather is as follows. If you're in the Jacksonville Orange Park area, you can expect a high today of 88 and a low of a chilly 60 degrees. Those of you in the Palak and St. Augustine area can expect similar temperatures of 86 and 83 degrees and lows hovering right at about 60. Today looks to be pretty clear and we'll start to get cloudy around 9 o'clock this morning and continue through 6 this evening. Tomorrow we'll round out about a degree cooler and a little cloudy with a 20% chance of rain. Looks like it'll be a nice Friday night to enjoy a frothy malt beverage. Now take a look at your 8-day forecast. It looks like that 20% chance of rain will continue through Wednesday. Sunday, however, your chances of rain are slightly higher, about 50%. So those of you headed outside for church on Sunday may want to grab an umbrella. That is, unless you can walk on water. Right, Duncan? Right, John. Thank you for the forecast, but that might be unfortunate for all you St. Patrick's Day fans. We will now go to Brittany for some insight on St. Patty's Day. Thank you, Duncan. With St. Patrick's Day just around the corner, corner, people have been on a frenzy of wearing green, eating green foods, and recycling all around the community for the hopes and excitement of dyeing the St. John's River green. That's right, the mayor of Jacksonville, Florida, along with the rest of the Jacksonville community, is dropping in 400 pounds of green vegetable dye into the St. John's River. This is to celebrate the green-tastic holiday of St. Patrick's Day. The dye is expected to last from three to four hours where the citizens of Jacksonville can admire and appreciate the luck of the Irish on this wonderful St. Patrick's Day. Beware, this, day has, this dye has a chemical that will permanently turn your skin green if within contact. Back to you, Duncan and Violet. Thank you, Violet, and good morning, Jacksonville. It's a beautiful day today, but not such a beautiful day to be on the roads. There's a 29-car pileup on I-95 in Atlantic, Though how the crash started has not been confirmed, it is reported that a UFO sighting distracted the young driver as they were trying to get a picture to upload on Facebook. More to come on the causes later. Geese, geese, geese are everywhere as you enter 295 and Town Center Parkway. It seems that even more geese have taken over the University of North Florida. The overcrowding of the birds are spreading into the streets, causing many to blockade the main entrances and thus backing up traffic for students entering and exiting campus. As usual, traffic is fairly heavy as you get onto the Buckman Bridge, but maintains speeds. A minor accident was reported just slightly south of I-95 in Baptist Medical Center, which has traffic just a little backed up, but regaining speeds as you come towards the exit. And lastly, traffic seems to be flowing like usual at I-95 and Butler Boulevard, as well as I-10 West and 295. I'm Carrie Leonard, and this has been your traffic update. Now back to you, Violet and Duncan. Carrie, you just blew my mind. I have to admit, I would be the one distracted by the UFO as well. Ha, <laughs> that's for sure. Let's start the rest of the day off with a laugh. Off to a viral video, thanks to Bree. Now to Brittany with a human interest story. Thank you, Duncan. Harriet Richardson's dream was to earn her bachelor degree in education. Richardson finally completed her goal about three weeks after another milestone in her life, her 100th birthday. Harriet graduated the University of Southern America with her bachelor in education and a minor in teeth whitening. Richardson said the two most important part of being a citizen in South America is being educated and having white teeth. Today was the passing of Richardson's life and, li and lived to be a total of 103 years old. Harriet's friends and colleagues say that Harriet has lived a great and wonderful life and finished it off with her love for teaching to young children and grabbing those pearly yellows and mouthwashing them clean. Back to you, Duncan and Violet. Well, that looks like all the international, national, and local news for today, Jacksonville. Have a thrilling Thursday. Signing off. Dunk this is Duncan. And Violet.